When my hope and strength is gone, you're the one who calls me on. You are the light, you are the fight that's in my side. Oh, your resurrection power burns like fire in my heart. When waters rise, I lift my eyes up to your throne.
Greetings, good morning, and welcome to Village Green Community Church. It's such a pleasure to worship uh, together with you on this Sunday morning. And I have two strategic communication uh, announcements for you. The first one's very exciting. The youth have an event coming up September 1st, and it's a pizza movie night. There's pizza, drinks, popcorn, and youth require two things for the event. The first is a lawn chair and the second one is a mask. The mask is just in case you need to go in the building to use the washroom. The mask isn't needed for the event of enjoying the movie and that youth connection time again, September 1st, 7.30 p.m. Now, very big in the life of the church is the 50th anniversary. That month of November is a time of great celebration. And also in that last Sunday of November, one of the big celebrations is those events in our journey in faith of baptism, membership to the church and parental dedication. So if you feel that over this time period, you, you've come to know who Christ is and you're excited in this and you feel that you might be participating in one of those events of baptism, the parental dedication, and the membership, feel free to contact the office. And it's one of those events that we will certainly be very happy to celebrate all together. And that is a joyous November month. So take care and stay safe. And uh, I'm really looking forward to worshiping with you in the service this morning. Bye. Thank you very much, Kathleen, for uh, doing that for us this morning, joining that team. Um, this is a reminder that we, we do have our offering is still available online, villagegreenchurch.com. Uh, if you feel, you know, feel like you want to give, you can go to the website. If you're just joining us, don't feel any obligation to give. We're, very just, we're just really glad that you're a part of our service uh, this morning. I actually wanted to take a moment. Uh, we have some, some fresh new volunteers at the back who are, are here to help out. Um, but I just want to shout out to, to Phil and to Aiden Weeb, because they've, they've been basically here every week since quarantine hit, and they're, they're finally able to take um, a, a Sunday off. And so if you, if you want to just uh, bless them, thank them for everything that, they, that they're doing. Also, just thank you to everyone who is, who is willing to step up now and to help us out. Um, we got some, some musicians back with me this morning, which is just, it's just a real blessing. So... Uh, it's great to move forward. It's great to sort of, sort of expand what we're doing here, and uh, it's an exciting, exciting process. But let's just go to prayer. Thank God for what He's doing uh, here, Father God. We do, we do thank you. We thank you for for those who are willing to serve, um, those who who who, who are, are willing to come and to to help make this live stream possible to to continue to worship you, um, and we thank you for those who are here. I just pray that we would be a blessing to them, those who are joining us online, that we would be able to bless them as well. Father God, we thank you for the good and perfect gift of your love, of your son, of your grace, and of your mercy. And Father God, we want to give back to you, uh, whether that's through our time, our money, our energy, uh, give back to you with our love, give back to you with our devotion. Would you just accept us and just use us for your glory, for your kingdom, and that we would just be a light, that we would, as we love you, as we love others, as we love our neighbor, that lives would be changed, that hearts would be renewed, and that people would see the light and love that you are and who you are and what you are doing in the world. Father God, we pray for the rest of this service and that we would just be able to, to see you, to hear from you, to be comforted, um, and to, to have our faith increase. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Oh, 
Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Our judge and our defender suffered and crucified forgiveness is in us descended into darkness he rose in glorious light forever seated us. I believe in God our Father I believe in Christ the Son I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in life eternal. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints' communion and in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe. In the name of Jesus. weapon may be formed of it won't prosper when the darkness falls it won't prevail the God I serve knows only how to triumph my God will never fail my God will never fail I'm gonna see your victory. 
I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. down from any giant I know how this story ends I know how this story ends I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm going to see a victory, for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory, I'm going to see a victory, for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory, I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good, turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good, you turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good, you turn it for good. A victory, I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory, I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory, I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good.
Good morning, and let's pray together as we move into this section of the of the service this morning. Father in heaven, I'm 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 just struck by some of the words in that particular song that we've just sung together. That we're going to see a victory. But Lord, for each and every one of us, that victory might look different because we're all fighting different battles or battles that maybe no one understands or no one knows. The battle might be loneliness. The battle might be depression. The battle might be an inability to see anything positive in the circumstances that we find ourselves. The, the, the difficulty might be a relationship. It might be work. It might be finances. It might be so many different things. And yet this song, as a reflection of Scripture, tells us that what the devil means for evil, God will bring it about to the good. That's not always a, a clear thing for us to see, and especially when, when all around us we are experiencing disruption. But I pray this morning, Lord, that you would speak into the lives of people as they speak your faith this morning that your spirit would comfort, your spirit would guide, your spirit's presence would be so evident in those people's lives that they would know that you are walking with them through whatever it is they're experiencing. So this morning, Lord, we do thank you for your presence. We do thank you that you are in control. We do thank you for your sovereignty. We do thank you for the fact that you are in the midst of these difficulties and that you are guiding circumstances to your inevitable end, and Lord, that it's going to be something that is good for each and every one of us, even though we can't fully understand it or embrace it right now. So that's our prayer this morning for everyone listening in today. May they just sense that from you this morning, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, once again, welcome to our service. Nice to have you here. And, you know, um, again, before we get into content, I want to just um, read another letter. We were getting letters in. You know, we've done this thing about, um, you know, your story, our church. And people have been writing in about what they're learning from God during this, this period of time. And, you know, if there's any way that Village Green is helping. So I have uh, a, a special privilege this morning to read a testimony from Amelia Husnick. She wrote in, and I want to read uh, her entire thing. It's, it's brief, but it's very, it's very powerful, and I hope this encourages you this morning as she writes this. COVID-19 has affected our lives in many ways, and we all have to learn to adapt to this new reality. There are things that I've missed greatly and still do, but they are less important than I would have thought before the pandemic. One thing that stands out in this time of physical distancing is that there seems to be more time in a day. I've experienced this as something very precious, almost like a gift, because nothing seems to be rushed or needs to be rushed. This has had a rad, rather profound influence on my daily time with the Lord, my prayer time and eagerness to learn more of God's word. I have noticed that my prayers are becoming longer and more meaningful. My time spent with the Lord is becoming such a time of blessing. I've always had difficulty concentrating and keeping my mind from wandering off during prayer. And I am so happy that I can be so aware of the fact that I am in God's presence and how awesome is that. Thank you, Village Green for providing great weekly services and for making me feel connected. And thank you, John, for the Monday night lessons on how to study the Bible. I count my blessings, Amelia Husnick. I think that's just a wonderful testimony. Thank you, Amelia, for sending that in. That really blesses me as well because there's so much that you put in there that I'm, it resonates in my own life about what is happening, especially with my prayer life, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, if you have something that you want to send in and encourage somebody, you know, you still have opportunity to do that. We'll put Amelia's 
um, you know, testimony in this week's newsletter, so look for it. Again, we had John Scott's news, um, testimony in last week's newsletter. If you missed it, you can just go back and read those. You know, can I challenge one of you out there to, to write something, especially if you're part of a family? I would love to hear, you know, how are, how are you as, as, as a family coping, you know? Uh, how are the children coping? What, are, what is God teaching you about being together as a family? And then having your kids with you all the time during this particular thing, and the anticipation of what it's like to go back to school, et cetera, et cetera. So maybe that's a great opportunity uh, for you to write in and bless other families that are going very much through the same thing at this time. Um, okay, as we get into content this morning, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever said, or have you heard somebody say, I'll believe it when I see it? <laughs> I'll believe it when I see it. Isn't that one of the most you know, common phrases you hear from people? And the thing is why it's become so common is uh, because I think there's a, there's a lot of uh, you know, uh, power behind I, I'll believe it when I see it. And the interesting thing about saying something like that is you know that there's a history. You know that there's experiences. You know that the person saying it is not saying it just in a very cavalier way. They're... they're they're, you know, particularly concerned with having such a demonstration of, of the, re, you know, of, of a change that they would love to see that they'll believe it when they actually see it. You know, um, I know many times uh, I've, I've said it because, you know, uh, there's a relationship that I've had for a long, long time. And the person has said, I will change or I will do this when this happens and you think in your mind you know yeah i'm going to believe it when i see it because we've been together a long long time and i've never seen you do this so i'll believe it when i see it you might work for a company and the company has said you know starting next month we're going to start doing this we're going to start caring for our employees in a particular way and you've all said it i'll believe it when i see it because i've worked for this company for so so long and never have they ever done anything like that. So often when we say, I'll believe it when I see it, there's usually very good reason that we would say it. There's history, there's experience, there's all kinds of, or it's against norm. We, we have a level of expectation, we have a level of normalcy, and those you know, reasons why we say that is because it's so contrary to what we've seen, it's so contrary to what we've understood, it's so contrary to what's been normal, that we need something to happen in order for us to change our minds about something in particular. And of course, we, you know, I believe it when I see it, you can attach that to zillions of circumstances and situations in life. And today, as we get into the very last message about the disciples, we are going to look at the poster boy of the disciples for I'll believe it when I see it, okay? And that's the man that we know as Thomas. And we're concluding this sermon series on the Jesus I see with this person known as Thomas. And Thomas is a very interesting character. You know, um, his, his name is Vivimus, uh, which in Greek is, you know, the word for twin. And we can't figure out if, who, who he's a twin of and, and, you know, who this person particularly is. But that's kind of like his, 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 his name base, and he's known as, as the twin. And um, we've known him as Doubting Thomas. Um, and, in, and in a few passages, what's really interesting, in a few passages we get kind of snapshots of this particular person known as Thomas. I'll probably repeat this later, but did you know that Thomas is only mentioned in the Gospel of John? Um, in the other Gospels, he is only listed with the other disciples. John is the only one that, that actually gives us some stories about Thomas. And I think there's a really profound reason. So last week, you know, we talked about two men, two of the disciples who are mystery men. We have no other information. We just have their names in the list. If it wasn't for the Gospel of John, Thomas would be a bit of a mystery to us as well. Um, you know, in one passage in the Gospel of John, I think it's John 11, um, Jesus says, I'm going to Jerusalem. And the disciples go, ah, you know, can't go back to Jerusalem. They, they want to kill you back in Jerusalem. And Thomas is the one that says, uh, we better go back and die with Jesus. Now, for some commentators, that's like a, a statement of, 
of being a hero. Um, for others, it's like, oh, he's, he's, like, he's the negative guy. Uh, we might as well just go with Jesus and we're going to die anyway. Okay, so, you know, there's a lot of controversy as to what that statement really projects about the person of Thomas. Um, he's also one of the four disciples. If you've gone through this series at all, you know in John 14, we've talked about the four disciples who asked particular questions. Thomas is one of the ones that asks a question during John 14. And Jesus has done, got, just got done saying, I go and I prepare a place for you. In my Father's house are many rooms, and I will come back to get you. When that place is ready, I will come back and get, get you. And Jesus kind of ends that statement, says, because you know where it is that I'm going. At that point, Thomas kind of stands up and goes, oh, wait a minute, Lord. We have no idea where you're going. Okay? In fact, he says it this way. We have no idea where you are going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus, in response to Thomas's, you know, question at that point, you know, makes that statement that so many of us know. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, that no one comes to the Father except through me, Jesus says. If you had really known me, you would know my father, who my father is. And he says, from now on, from now on, you do know him and you have seen him. So that's in, in response to Thomas asking this question, but we really don't know where you're going or, or what you're doing. And Jesus points to himself as the way, as the truth and the life. That if you want to understand the path to, you know, life in general, is that Jesus is the person that you have to look to to understand all of that. But the one passage that, that kind of created this idea that Thomas was this great doubter is in John 20. This is after the resurrection, and Jesus has appeared to his disciples. And on one occasion, he appears to the disciples, and Thomas isn't even there. And the disciples are so excited about experiencing the resurrected Jesus that the next time they see Thomas, they're telling Thomas about it. And Thomas, you know, in, in John 20, 25, resp you know, responds to the disciples who said, we have seen the Lord. But Thomas' replies, I won't believe it. I won't believe it unless I see the nail marks or the nail wounds in his hands or I put my fingers into them and place my hand into the wound in his side. Now, in all fairness, I think we've all been there. at some element of our lives where we've said, I'll believe it when I see it. There's so many times that we have got these doubts, we've got these questions. In fact, we even have these fears that happen in our lives where we have to say, I'll believe it when I see it. Now, here's the thing about Thomas, and here's the reality about the world that we live in. If you want to bring a modern kind of application to this whole idea of Thomas saying to the other disciples, I'll only believe it when I see it. I don't believe what you've just said, because it is so beyond what is understandable, because people just don't walk out of a grave. People just don't, you know, resurrect and walk again, and you've seen him. There's got to be some more tangible proof that I need in order to believe this, un un you know, unthinkable thing that you're telling me that you've experienced, okay? So can we just be honest about Thomas's doubt at this point in time? But here's the problem, and here's one of the things that happens for you, for me, and it's something that we experience all the time, okay? When it comes to our fears, when it comes to our doubts, when it comes to our questions about life, we are often looking more for confirmation than we are than being challenged. We are looking more for confirmation. We don't want to be corrected about our fears, about our doubts, or about our questions. In fact, we want to be, you know, we want to experience confirmation about the very things that we say, you know, I'll believe it when I see it. We want those, you know, doubts and fears and, and questions that we have about reality. We want it to be confirmed. You know, we're told all the time, trust your gut. Trust, you know, trust how you're feeling. Trust, all, you know, all that kind of stuff. This is Thomas trusting his gut. People just don't walk out of a grave. And I want confirmation of my doubts. 
or I need to be corrected about my doubts. But the fact of the matter is we want whatever bias that we have, we want it confirmed. In fact, what's interesting about social media, for instance, we talk about social media, whatever you search on social media, whatever social media sees as your bias, they actually send you more material about what it is that you're searching for. So whatever bias you have, if you're looking for some, you know, kind of theory about something, you'll suddenly notice that social media is pooling all your, your, you know, most of your material based on the confirmation bias that you're looking for. It's not ever offering correction, rarely offering correction, but we're always looking for our biases to be confirmed. In fact, we actually can stand back and say, You know, history has confirmed my bias. History has confirmed my doubts and my questions. I just can't, you know, I can't just can't believe this, okay? And we look for confirmation of of those biases. That's why as you get, that's, that's why as you get older, you move often from, open optimism to a sense of pessimism. That's why you, uh, you know, may have seen things as good and suddenly they become bad. How many times have you heard somebody say, you know, oh, I really admire that person. The person says, wait till you get to know them. Because after you've lived with them for a while, after you've known them for a while, you're going to see the cracks. And even though, you know, you're optimistic and, you know, you, you saw something in them, there's something about getting close to that person that sees them as they really are that suddenly grows a sense of, you, you know, disappointment. That's why when you get older, it's hard to fight cynicism. It's, it's hard to fight cynicism because the more that you learn about the world and the way it works, it seems to confirm a kind of bias towards a negativity that is so easily ingrained in us. We want proof. We want, we want something to be very objective. We, you know, that's, why, that's why we have so many arguments in church about church being relevant. And people go, oh, the church isn't, doesn't need to be relevant and all this kind of stuff. Well, you know, if people don't see it as something real in your life, then they're gonna, it just confirms their bias that there's really nothing for them in the first place. It's a, it's a, it, it, it's, it's, it's what we tend to do naturally. It's whatever our fears are, whatever our biases are, whatever our, um, you know, questions and doubts, we love to have them confirmed. In fact, we love to say, I knew it all along, I told you so, it was something that I just felt in my gut, and, you know, I've just had it confirmed. And here's what happens. We, we can get so bent into our confirmation bias that to move in the direction of correction, which is what the Bible loves to do, is to move us from, you know, our confirmations to a place of correction, that, you know, it takes something epic to move us to a place of correction. And again, this is really tough the older you get, because the older you get, the more you can confirm the biases, the more you confirm your, your doubts, the more that your questions, you know, get solidified. And the problem is, is to move to a total change of attitude, a total change of heart, it usually takes something pretty dramatic. It takes something pretty epic. It takes something that, you know, it's so, it, 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 it so makes you stand up and say, wow, this, this is totally against what I've ever thought. This is one of the reasons why a lot of people start looking for God when tragic things happen in their lives or there's trauma or something like that because it's, you know, it's taken them uh, outside of their confirmation bias or uh, you know, an attitude or a doubt about God even existing that it didn't even matter to them. And then suddenly something happens and, and it's been so epic in their lives. They start asking the question, well, maybe I've been wrong. Maybe I've been wrong. Maybe... Maybe there's something more to this. And I've had these doubts, and these doubts have sort of pushed me in a direction where I've never thought it was even worth investigating. It takes something epic. And in fact, I will tell you, I I think transformational living has to move us outside of of our confirmation problems. That's where transformational living really helps, is that... You know, when you have your confirmations about your, your doubts and your biases and your questions, and they get challenged, 
and you start seeing things differently and God is shaping the questions and the doubts of your life and you're starting to see things get corrected and things start to blossom in a different way that you never saw before, I think that's absolutely the picture of transformational living. I remember for, you know, I remember for, my, for myself when, when I became a believer. It, I, I, I experienced personal transformation because I started seeing the world in a totally different way. I started understanding the world in a totally different way. I started, I started you know, understanding that grace is really a different thing, that love is really a different thing, that, that, that we are inherently sinful. In fact, what, what became very prominent for me is I could see, the, see the, the, the doctrine of sin so clearly that I couldn't see before, even in my own life, in, in such a way that was very profound. And that whole transformational element that happened inside of me was the fact that I was going outside of my doubts and my questions and I was moving into a place of being corrected with all of those. Why is it that so many times Jesus says to the people, this incredibly religious culture, this incredibly religious nation, he says, let me teach you. Why would Jesus have to teach them about God, about you know, their heavenly father, about the law, about their feasts, their festivals? Why, why would Jesus have to correct them on, on so much of that? Okay? Um, and here's, here's what I, I believe about Thomas. Um, for Thomas, it's not really, I'll believe it when I see it. For Thomas, it's really, I'll believe it when I believe it. That it's much more than seeing. Thomas has just said, he doesn't want to just see it. He's going to have to touch it. He's going to have to, you know, inspect, you know, the, 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 the marks that, that took his life that it's much more than that for him, okay? And, and, you know, and that's true for many of us, right? It's not often we say, believe it when we see it, but we want you know, proof beyond that. There are so many people that you would say, you know, I believe in God. But it doesn't matter in their daily lives. It doesn't make any difference in their lives. They can objectively say, I believe in God. That's an abstraction. But it does nothing to their daily lives. It do, or, or it doesn't even prompt them to say, if, I, if, if God is real, then I need to find out how I need to live in light of that truth. You know, it, it's not, you know, you can have those, those two elements and not live them out. But for, for Thomas, I, I really do believe it's much more than I'll believe it when I see it. It's I'll believe it when it becomes something real inside my heart, something real inside my life that I believe it to that degree. So here's the passage I want to look at this morning that really pushes this whole thing. This is the epic event for Thomas that we've talked about. Eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. And here's what he said. He says, peace be with you. Now, again, this is really important. If you, you know, I think a couple of messages ago, we talked about the exit message that Jesus was giving his disciples before the crucifixion was the message of peace. It's going to, peace is what I'm leaving with you. The greeting that Jesus gives the disciples after the resurrection is peace. I've come to deliver the peace that I was leaving you with, and now I'm delivering it into your lives, says the greeting. Very, very important. He said, then he looks at Thomas, and he says to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side, and I love this, don't be faithless any longer. Here's a disciple who's been with Jesus for at least three and a half years, and Jesus is saying to Thomas, do not be faithless anymore. Just believe. Thomas replies with my Lord and my God. John 20, 26 and 28. Here's, you know, before I unpack that, here is what the Jesus I see from Thomas's vantage point. Jesus as far as Thomas is concerned, has challenged all my fears, all my doubts, all my questions, and transformed them into belief. 
He's taken all of the things that I, I, I wanted objective proof about. He took all the things that I had doubts and fears and questions. And Jesus just evaporated all of those and turned them into belief. It was much more than I believe it when I see it. It's all about I believe it when I believe it. Okay? And the understanding of belief is really, really important here. Now, many of us you know, will probably read this proclamation from Thomas of my Lord and my God and just say, okay, that's, that's just a really neat proclamation. But it is very, very powerful. And I need to unpack it for you because it's not just a simple statement that we just read back. We have to understand in the context just what Thomas is really saying. You see, Thomas didn't just say my Lord. And he didn't just say, my God, but he combined those two things together. In the Greek, it's okiriosmu ke otheosmu, okay? Okiriosmu is, you know, the God of mine and, the, you know, the Lord of mine and the God of mine. That's the, you know, literal Greek trans- translation of that. In other words, my Lord and my God. If Thomas had just said, my Lord, then... People would have argued he's just a master. He's just um, you know, a higher authority of some kind. You know, in that day and age, slaves would call, um, you know, servant masters, they would call him my Lord, right? It was nothing to call uh, someone higher up than you or something more important or a political official, a military official as a Lord. That was kind of like a master over your life. That was a very common thing to appeal to one and to another person, to attach to another person. So, um, but in the context of religion, Lord takes a lot more context in, 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 the, you know, in, the, in the category of religion. That Lord now says a mastery over your life, okay? And I'll get back to that in just a second. And not only that, is, is that Thomas says, my God as well. Otheosmu. And, and the fact that he's saying God is recognizing that Jesus is just not another prophet. He's just not another person sent by God. He's not just a person that, that has gotten, you know, uh, on the same wavelength of God or anything like that. That he is deity. That he is God incarnate. That he is the one that was with the Heavenly Father and commanding the universe to be put into place. All of the things that we read about Yahweh in the Old Testament especially is now prevalent in the person of Jesus Christ that is standing right in front of him. And because of that, when you attach my Lord and my God, it's the acknowledgement of who Jesus is. Jesus is just not another person. Jesus is just not another prophet. Jesus is the Son of God, the incarnate Son of God, who came to sacrifice himself and, and become the propitiation for our sin, to cleanse us whole, to make, to redeem us, and, and all of those beautiful things that salvation brings that only God could achieve, that we could never achieve on our own. And that's one beautiful picture. But when he says Lord, what, what becomes really powerful about that is that from now on, acknowledging that Jesus is God and now he is my Lord, that means that the rest of my life I live out with, the, with, with Jesus Christ as the model of how I need to live. It means I love differently. It means I, I live differently in my relationships with people. It means I, you know, my heart is in tune with our Heavenly Father. It means that every decision I make is done through the filter of what it is to have Jesus as my master. This is an epic event for Thomas. For him to state this, it's not just... <sighs> it's, it's absolutely rocked his world to witness this. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't really see evidence of Thomas even going and touching Jesus at this point. He is so rocked by the experience. He's so moved by it that it's my Lord and my God. You see, in your life, those two have to come together. If you truly are a follower of Jesus Christ, those two, as a Christian, have to come together. That Jesus is God, not just another prophet, messenger of God. He is God incarnate. And your life is shaped by the life of Jesus. That's what it means to be a disciple. So 
as, as testimonies go in the Bible, that's, this is a huge one. And it's a question you can ask yourself. You know, every morning when you get up, can you say, Jesus, I'm starting my day. You are my God and my Lord. That, that should shape the entire way you live your life. Having acknowledged those two, you know, statements that Thomas acknowledged about the person and the work of Jesus Christ. That my Lord and my God is very, very important. And in fact, the proclamation by Thomas at this point in time in the Gospel of John really is a proclamation that confirms Jesus' claim back in John 14 that he is the way, the truth, and the life. You know, when, when, when Thomas asked the question, Lord, we don't know where you're going. Jesus answered him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The proclamation by Thomas at the end of the Gospel of John is basically saying, yeah, I recognize that you are indeed the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one, no one comes to Heavenly Father except through you, because you are the way, the truth, and the life. Here's Doubting Thomas, who I think is like the epitome of so many people in our culture today. I'll believe it when I see it. Or I'll believe it <laughs> when I believe it. And they want objective proof. Here is a man who walked with Jesus and yet was so profoundly moved when he saw the resurrected Lord. And Jesus actually gives a benediction at the end, of a, kind of a, a, a blessing, and says, you know, bless you, Thomas, because you've witnessed this, you know. Blessed are those who believe and yet did not have the same experience that you are having. That's, that's powerful. Because, you know, I think in a way Jesus is acknowledging the many people who are going to come along and say, you know, I'll believe it when I see it. And yet Thomas stands as wonderful proof that our confirmations can sometimes, like our, our, our desire to have our fears and our doubts and our questions confirmed, that something epic like Jesus coming into your life can change your entire world and lead you to a point of correction and lead you to connecting with God in a really powerful way. You know, it's interesting, but Thomas, like all the other disciples, was, was killed. But before that, he traveled through what many believe was, you know, um, Iran, Iraq area, well into India. And in fact, Thomas is credited with leading many of the Assyrian nation, for instance, to faith. He's known as you know, one, of, one of their saints. And in fact, the Assyrian nation was the largest Christian nation shortly after you know, uh, the life of Jesus. They were the first major Christian nation afterwards. And Thomas is credited with being a, a, a big instrument of leading many of those people to the Lord. Imagine his whole life was dramatically changed. And what I find very interesting is that they believe that he was killed in India in 72, July. Actually, we have a date, July 3rd, 72 AD, which I don't know if we have any kind of very specific date about, about any of the other disciples. But he was killed with a lance. Now, if that tradition holds true, isn't it fascinating that Thomas wanted to touch the side of Jesus where the spear entered the side to prove his doubt? And yet he himself was killed in that way. Thomas had peace. Thomas had the Spirit of God, but Thomas had a profound, epic belief in the person and the work of Jesus of Nazareth. 
We've said many, many times um, what happens when 12 ordinary men meet an extraordinary Jesus. And we've seen in the life of Thomas what happens when a doubter, when a person who wasn't absolutely sure about Jesus and his claims is confronted with Jesus in a way that destroys all his questions, destroys all his doubts, destroys all his fears, and turns him into an amazing apostle for the kingdom of God. You know, it's just a really powerful picture, and I think it's a, it's a fitting picture of the experience of this one disciple who is among 12 that we have looked at over the last nine weeks. I hope this series has blessed you. I hope this series has challenged you. And I hope this series has given you some insight about the disciples and just how much they were impacted by the person of Jesus Christ and the difference it made in their lives. These men went out after the resurrection through the book of Acts and, and, and further, as we have seen, and they changed the world because of a message of hope, because of a message of a resurrected Lord that turned these ordinary men into extraordinary apostles for the furtherance of the kingdom of God. And you know what? We have that same experience, ability, and power today because it's the same Holy Spirit and it's the same peace that Jesus promised this doubting disciple and challenged him with his doubts. So let me pray. I hope, again, I hope you've been blessed by this series. I hope you've been blessed by what we've learned about these 12 men that were the closest to Jesus in the ministry years that he was on this earth. And I hope it's given you new insights about these men and just how much they were impacted. By Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, heaven, thank you for the message of Thomas that, Lord, he is so indicative of the kinds of challenges that we face today of so many people. And yet, this epic event in his life just changed all of his doubts and fears and his questions. And in fact, they just didn't matter anymore that when we come face to face with the resurrected Lord, when we come face to face with the truth of Jesus Christ, that maybe our doubts don't even get answered at all, but it doesn't matter anymore because what we've witnessed in the resurrected power of Jesus is so overwhelming that our doubts, even though they may exist, or our questions that even though they may exist, no longer become poor, important. In fact, the only thing that matters is our faith in Jesus Christ. So I thank you for his message today and the witness and the example that he gives for so many. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, I want to invite you next week to a brand new series called Reset. You know we've, we're in a, in a season of disruptions and, uh, you know, the church and the people of God have experienced disruptions over, you know, so many years of history. How do we reset whenever we come into such a time of disruption? Join us next week and we'll start answering that question. God bless. Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever sing. 
Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. You opened up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever see. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you. You opened up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me. With your heart and lead me in your love to those around to pray. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for revealing who you are to us. And with eyes of faith, we can see you. And with hearts of hope, we can believe in you. And you will lead us and you will be before us. And so, Father God, would you accept the worship that we have given to you? Would you accept the worship of our life as we live for you and build our life upon you the only one we can build our life on that won't disappoint us, that won't abandon us, that won't leave us, that
that will be with us forevermore. We pray this in your wonderful and beautiful name, Lord Jesus.